All right, let's start then. Welcome to this talk about biomimetics. So welcome to all of those in the room and welcome to all of those uh, following it online. So today we're going to talk a little bit about biomimetics, basically. So that's the idea of taking ideas from nature into technology. Particularly going to focus uh, the examples on what animals can teach us. There will also be a few plant examples just because those are the ones that are actually most commercially uh, available today. Um, but let's just have a quick overview of what we're going to talk about. So basically, I'll start out, as I said, giving us a brief overview of what is actually biomimetic, the historic background, and then I will focus on four different case studies, basically. So I've entitled them, so getting an idea about fish on the water robots, geckos and adhesion, and insects and flying robots, and finally spiders uh, and their silk, basically, and how an extraordinary material that is. So I'm actually more of a spider person myself, so I'll <laughs> <laughs> focus a little bit more on that example, perhaps, than some of the other examples. I should probably also probably introduce myself. I'm Thomas Hesselberg. I'm the Director of Studies for Biological Sciences here at the department. As I said, my background is as a biologist, but I did actually do a PhD in biomimetics in Bath, not focusing on spiders at the time, but focusing on ratworms. I haven't included anything really about ratworms, because that's not quite as interesting as spiders and the other animals I'm going to show, but um, I do have a little bit of an engineering background, but the talk is mainly going to focus on the biological side of things, and maybe giving us an idea about the very fascinating uh, animal behaviors, animal morphologies that's out there, and how potentially they can be used um, to generate new ideas for our own technology. Okay, so what is actually biomimetics? So I said it's the idea basically of taking ideas from uh, nature into technology, but there's various ways where you can define it, and there's sort of different definitions. So a very simple one is it's basically, as I said, biomimetic refers to human-made processes, systems that imitate nature. So of course the idea is not just to imitate nature, but to take the, the actual concept that the uh, biological process delivers and try to improve that or abstract that into our technology. So we don't necessarily want to make uh, processes or organisms that are exactly like uh, the animals out there. We want to use the actual uh, ideas. So this is what uh, some of the other definitions kind of say. I mean, again, definition perhaps that's quite short, well, the abstraction of good design from nature. So taking a bit further, you take the idea uh, of the design and you try to incorporate that into technology. So also some uh, authors, and I'm probably leaning a little bit more towards that one, that in order to be biomimetics, you should really refer to, either you should conduct research on the animals or the organisms yourself, or at least you should refer to the scientific literature um, that's being conducted on those animals, because otherwise it's, it is very abstract if you just say, okay, I was inspired uh, by nature, but you haven't actually looked at uh, the natural processes in any great detail. I should also say, by the way, that although this is in a kind of formal setting, I mean, we, can, we don't have to make it that formal. If you do have any questions as we go along, just ask me. I love to get interrupted, basically, so don't <laughs> worry about that. Okay, so biomimetics basically is quite of a new field, uh, a new research field, and it's actually, the word itself was actually first used uh, in the 70s, basically, so it, it's quite a, a new word. Uh, and following that word, there's been the invention of a couple of similar uh, words that more or less means the same, but perhaps not always exactly. So one of them is bionics. Basically, traditionally in the, in the English-speaking countries, bionics perhaps refer a little bit more to sort of human implants, so artificial limbs or artificial organs or something like that that you're going to do uh, with the technology side. But in, the, in mainland Europe, bionics basically means the same as biomimetics. Then there's biomimicry, a quite new word as well, uh, coming from the US. Also meaning, of course, taking ideas from nature, but perhaps having a little bit more of a sort of save the world slant to it. So the idea is that not only are you taking the sort of general processes from nature, but you're also taking the, the ideas from nature that you conserve energy, you use few material, you produce uh, the processes, the materials in a non-toxic way on the ambient temperatures and, and so forth. And then finally, there's biologically inspired design, 
which perhaps is a little bit more sort of loose in that then you can just sort of say you have been inspired by looking at, at things. Um, but I, I mean, if, if you hear any of these words, just assume they mean more or less the same as, as biometrics. They all mean more or less the same. So, of course, although the, the research field itself, the word, quite new, it's not new that we are getting inspired from nature, of course, when we want to produce things. I mean, you can even argue that the very first kind of tools we made were taken from nature and that we were trying to imitate the claws and the teeth of animals, basically, in, in, when we were trying to make our tools. So you could argue that was a form of biologically inspired design. Um, you have, of course, the Leonardo da Vinci's quite famous drawings about how to try and make a flying machine didn't succeed, but that's probably a quite good example of actual real biometrics because he was quite clearly inspired by actual studies of birds and the birds' wings and tried to develop uh, a mechanism that could fly in a similar way. Of course, what he didn't realize is that you have to, well, I guess he realized, but what, if he had built the, the material, he would have realized that you can't actually produce enough power to flap the wings at a high enough speed just by uh, leg power, basically. So, um, so that didn't really work out. But I mean, he was clearly inspired by nature and also in some of his other ideas. More recently, we also have, of course, in architecture, we have quite a lot of biologically inspired design. I'm sure most of you are familiar with Gordy and his amazing buildings in Barcelona, basically, very, very sort of have a very organic feel to them. Again, you could say that was uh, biologically inspired, although not biometrics, because he wasn't studying exactly the, the nature of it. But we also have a few sort of more recent stories, uh, success stories, basically, of biometrics. Again, they come before the actual invention of the field of biometrics, though, but probably the most famous material that would have, that have come about in a biometric sense is Velcro. So basically, the idea was that the engineer, George D. Mistral, who invented Velcro, was out walking his dog in the forest. And what he noticed was when he got home, or when he walked there, the burdocks, since you all sort of know the, the cockle bird, perhaps, and the burdocks, they attached to the, to the um, fur of the dog. And when he came home, he realized they were quite difficult to actually remove. And that got him intrigued intrigued, why were they so difficult to remove? Uh, and he looked at them under a microscope and he tried to replicate the process in, in fabrics and eventually he came up with Velcro that was uh, patented in 1955. So if we want to understand a little bit more um, about how it works, basically we have the burdock here. The burdocks consist of very, very fine um, hooks and they attach to the fur of the dog, or in this case the sheep, in that they hook into uh, the material and then they basically stick. So what he tried to do was creating the two different type of material as well as you, you all have seen the Velcro uh, mechanisms. I know if you, and if you look more carefully, you'll see that the two sides are not the same. One of them is harder, consists of a hook-like structure, and the other one is, um, is more... Uh, Look more like the actual fur, so both sort of more hair-like uh, structures. Of course, one of the advantages of uh, Velcro is that it's also, although it sticks quite well, it's also easy to uh, peel and attach and reattach. In the real um, sense of the burdock, of course, the idea is also eventually it should reattach, right? There's no idea in carrying uh, the seeds around if they never attach, and they never detach, basically. So that's also worked in the natural system. I should also say, of course, the idea for the plant obviously is that by attaching to a, a, a fur and being dragged along by an animal moving around, it gets the, the seed dispersed away from the, from the mother plant, basically. Okay, so that was one example of a material that we all know, of an idea that we all know that is definitely commercially available. A, a rather newer idea, but it's also beginning to become um, commercially available now, is the, the lotus effect, basically. And that's the, the idea that on some plant surfaces you'll have water basically rolling off very, very easily. And it actually came about again as a sort of, almost as a coincidence, that botanists were looking at plant surfaces under the scanning electron microscope. So I don't know if you know what a scanning electron microscope is, but it's basically a, a way of, of seeing very small structures in, in, a, in a clear way that not, doesn't use light, it uses um, the electrons basically. 
And the idea is then that they were looking at these uh, plants and they didn't realize just by accident that some of the plant surfaces, or some of the plant leaves were much cleaner than others. And that got them thinking a little bit, got them looking into the actual, what were the actual differences when you looked at the plant surfaces under the microscope. And they came up with the idea that it's the actual surface roughness uh, of the plants that determine how well they can clean themselves in a, in a way, self-cleaning effect. I have a video basically to just briefly show off uh, the local sand material. It's a little bit of a commercial. I'm not affiliated in any way with this company. It's just to show uh, the, the whole process. We can probably get it in because it's quite... Uh, I'll show after in the next slide how it actually works, but I just wanted you to show that because it is kind of amazing. So this is obviously a material that painted with this uh, thing that now it puts on some sand or mud and then basically just water and you should then be able to see um, in a second how well the material actually removes the, um, the thing. So you see the idea is if you can get something on that on house walls, on cars, and stuff like, you may never have to clean anything ever again because the rain will basically clean the surfaces for you. At least that's the sort of the, the selling point on, on that. I mean of course in the real life the material probably will get damaged over time and then not work quite as well as that. But so how does it actually work? Well the idea is that when they looked um, under the microscope to get an idea of the structures they noticed that actually the the ones that have very good cleaning uh, capabilities have a very rough surface. So they have some, um, some crystals basically on the top. So this, uh, know if this one can actually point. Uh, so they have some crystals on the top. So this is the top of the leaf here. We have magnified uh, dramatically so you can, you can see the differences. And then the idea is that because of those tips basically, any dirt material has very little contact with the actual plant surface. So there has very little uh, adhesion to the actual surface. So you see the two examples here. In a smooth one, you have all of the material, the, do the dust particles or whatever, are in full contact with the plant surface in, uh, I don't know if you can see it, but this one is supposed to be the rough one over on this side. So you'd be able to see that now it's only resting on a few of the, the crystals. So that means when a water droplet rolls by, there's more adhesion to the water droplet than there is to the surface of the, the leaf. So is that kind of clear how the meaning is? Obviously a very brief explanation, but hopefully just gives you the general principle of, of how that works. It's, it's quite a clever system, and as I said, there are, they are producing commercially available uh, products with that um, using the loose effect. Okay, but so some of the examples, well, all of the examples so far, and also indeed most of the examples I will cover later on as well, are examples of sort of bottom-up where it's kind of by accident, really. I mean, that you were, it's mainly biologists or people in the natural world that are studying some natural phenomenon, and then they come up with, hey, this is quite exciting. What can we do uh, with this kind of uh, phenomenon? But there's also another way of doing it, um, which is top-down way basically where you start out with a problem you have some engineers in from the beginning you start out with a problem and then you try and look for solutions in nature so if we sort of more of a quick go through sort of a more theoretical way of doing it but you start with a problem basically then you generalize the problem a little bit further out then you look you search the biological um, literature search the biological information try and see how would how have nature solved a similar problem? You then try and extract the relevant mechanisms of how nature solves this problem. Try and co incorporate that into um, your design principle in the engineering sense. And you then basically should have an idea of how you can incorporate that in the end. And you need to make, obviously, prototypes and eventually, hopefully, get products out of it. So there is a way of doing that now that is easier uh, in a way. I mean, there is something called Ask Nature. I don't know if any of you heard about Ask Nature before. It's a relatively new website um, where you basically see if it's going to work. 
we're basically going to um, um, ask any kind of questions, basically any kind of design things about and then see how would nature solve something similar. So if we just do it for a little bit of a try, does any of you have anything you'd like to know? I mean, it's always more dangerous, of course, when I'm doing this <laughs> live with any kind of ideas, but we can just, does any of you have some ideas? What, anything you want to know? Catching flies, yes, but we want to sort of, I think we want to have it as an idea for a, a pro, an engineering type of also some sort of technology. So catching flies, I could, could be sort of abstract. Suppressing mood. Sorry? Suppressing weeds. Suppressing? Like keeping, yeah, keeping weeds down. Keeping weeds down. Crops. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Again. <laughs> yeah, okay, I'll, I'll just do the one I've practiced then. <laughs> I'm going to do that one anyway. But no, I mean, if you have something like energy, conserve energy, for example, or energy efficiency, well, we can also actually can conserve water as well, conserve energy, conserve heat. If we do something like that, basically, so that would be a principle, right? We want to, we are developing something, we want to conserve energy with whatever we're doing. Now we're going to ask nature how that does it. Um, and then basically, so the way that the, the database work is that it gives you quite a lot of uh, different ideas. So most, this is obviously still uh, um, a work in progress, so that not, not all of these ideas look particularly impressive. And some of this, by the way, for instance, looks more like an actual engineering product rather than a solution in nature. But there is, uh, I think, some ideas. So for instance, here, if we wanted to look at how animals store energy when they jump, for instance. So how do they conserve energy during locomotion? We could, for instance, get inspired by the wallaby. What, what they have here then is a sort of overview of, of the concept. Um, again, I'm not really making a commercial thing for this particular website, not affiliate with in any way. I'm just trying to demonstrate one of the ideas how you could do that. So there's quite a lot of information there on some of the main uh, concepts about it and hopefully there should be some kind of um, reference yeah exactly where you'd be able to read more so that it's sort of a way for non-biologists or engineers everyday people basically getting an idea how where would they start if they wanted to know more about this particular problem and how that's solved in nature so i mean i recommend you to all sort of go home and have a little bit play around and even maybe try some of these suppressing weed and things but I think it's just that's more sort of a biological control and ecological way of, of uh, combating that but I hope you can see the idea that um, that we can we can ideally get it, get some solutions over I mean as I said the website is not always great because sometimes there won't be good scientific references and other times so you saw some of the examples there it's not really biology actually it's referring to but it's it's a it's a database that's being built and I think most people can just basically sign up and then contribute ideas and then they have editors going through them but uh, in some cases they still need to edit it a little bit more but it's, it's an interesting um, idea for how you can sort of get your inspiration for designing new products yeah how about like uh, fighting malaria or some diseases and stuff like that I mean, we can try and see that. I'm, I'm not sure it gives anything because it's more, I think it's, it's mainly geared towards the, as I said, engineering idea. But we can try and see what, what would actually happen if, if we write that fighting malaria. That doesn't really suggest anything, but let's see what it actually happens if we do that. Well, nothing seems to happen. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, that, that does come. Okay, mm -hmm. so you do actually get some information about at least uh, my malaria here. Potentially, even you could get inspired by a spider. That's actually exciting. <laughs> so there's <laughs> spider, <laughs> spiders eating the mosquito, of course. Um, so to what degree some of this would be self-medicating to prevent malaria house sparrows? Well, there is actually quite, I mean, that sounds potentially like some ideas you, you could get for um, combating malaria. So the website is potentially even better than I, uh, I thought. Um, yeah, so, okay, but let's, that's sort of, um, well, there's one more slide before we go to some more continue here. So the idea is that um, 
the research field, as I said, is actually quite growing. It's a new field, but it's, it's quite dramatically growing. As you can see, basically, so I just started, I looked, this is um, sort of number of publications in, number of scientific publications in a database. I just did a quick search for, for biomimetics, basically, for over the years. So you see the red bars are the number of publications with the keywords biomimetics somewhere in the, in the title of the abstract or, or in the keywords. And the blue line is the percentage of total publications, so the percentage of uh, publications that contain, contains biomimetic in it. So as you see, it's quite small percentages, uh, but nonetheless, you can see that it's increasing, basically. You can see both the total number of, pub of publications of biomimetics increasing, perhaps not so surprising, because the total number of publications is decreasing dramatically in these uh, years. But more interestingly is also the percentage of publications that contain, bi contain biomimetics are increasing as well. So it's quite clear that it's a very large growing research field. However, despite all this growth in the actual research, we still don't have many biomimetic products. Basically, so the, the two that I just mentioned are basically sort of the two real products and the Lotus and one is just not really. I mean, I think you can buy it now, but it's still in an in a, in a early growth phase. So there's not too many success stories about that. So why is that? Uh, well, I'll come into that with some of the examples, but the main thing is, of course, that biology is really, really complex. <laughs> and in order to understand the concepts we are doing there, we need to understand the biology. And in some cases, we don't understand the biology to the uh, enough degree that we can actually extract the ideas. And in other aspects, we may understand what's going on, but we are not, our technology is still not capable of producing something as complex as the biological system. Um, so, but let me go through some of the sort of the examples that I took out before. And as I said, these are not necessarily examples that are the closest ones to being commercially available. Indeed, some of those are very far from being commercially available, but I just thought that they're quite nice examples and they cover a bit of a different uh, groups of animals. So the first one I, was, was, I looked at was sort of fish and underwater robots. So there's something called autonomous underwater vehicles or underwater ro robots. And the idea is that if you have robots that can move by themselves under the sea, you can use them for all kinds of purposes, obviously for commercial uh, pur purposes, so sort of looking for oil, but also for surveillance and for general checking of the health of the oceans uh, and that kind of thing, and of course also uh, which basically when we talk about robot, we have to acknowledge the military <laughs> applications to it because lots of the money for developing those kind of things comes from the military. That's unfortunately uh, the way it is. Uh, but that does not necessarily mean, of course, that the technology sh will only be used for, for those kind of purposes. But so why, why looking at biologically inspired ones, why not just have propellers and that kind of thing? Well, the idea is if you use biologically inspired uh, movement, it's much more Agile is more energy efficient, and potentially it can also, again, for military purposes, perhaps it can be much more stealth movement, maybe much more difficult to detect those kind of things in uh, the water. So there's quite a number of different uh, organisms and fish, mainly of course, that we can use for um, sort of inspiration. One of the ones I've highlighted here is the ghost fish, ghost knife fish, or the knife fish, and then is the it's part of the weakly electric fish, which are basically fish, that's fish that um, feed by detecting uh, small uh, electrical signals, electrical fields from their prey. Quite interesting organisms from a biological perspective as well, which is also part of the reason why I put them here. But what is particularly interesting in this uh, example here is that they have, rather than having several different fins like most fish, they have a large ribbon-like fin, basically. And that allows these animals to move in a very controlled manner, basically. So they can move quite slowly forward and backward. So there's been some attempts to try to make uh, an artificial ribbon using that on a robot that can move underwater. So obviously, as you can imagine, the additional problems with developing underwater robots, of course, because you need to make sure that the water doesn't come into the actual robot and destroys all the electronics. But again, I have a little uh, video uh, hope perhaps I haven't actually got it in the mode. So a little video of um, first the actual fish. So the robots is 
is not quite as sophisticated perhaps, but nonetheless you will see that it, that it does <laughs> do the trick. But first we start with the actual fist, so you can just get an idea, it's a little bit dark, but you get an idea how the ribbon fin is being used to move the animals in all kind of different angles, backwards and forwards, very slow movements. Obviously, as I said, they look for electrical signals of prey in the bottom, so it's useful for them to be able to scan in a slow motion almost um, the, the seafood bed. Um, but you can also see how they can turn around and things like that. There's other type of um, knife fish that has the ribbon on the top, similar principles basically. I mean, the, the main idea is that it allows the fish to swim backwards almost as easily as it can swim forward as well, and as I said, turning around in, in tight angles. So then we have an example of the robot. doesn't look exactly like the fish, we have to admit, at the, at the moment, but um, nonetheless, you see that it moves quite similar to, um, to that of the actual fish. I mean, so that you, you can see the rest of the video. Um, but I think I'll, I can see I'm actually using a little bit more time than I thought. Uh, I do apologize for speaking a lot, but it's uh, some of it is. But just to, okay, let me just show this one because, you know, the robot they have, it, it can, the idea is, of course, to make it completely autonomous in the end, but they're far away from there. But they already have some systems of making it moving back and forth in the water column as well. So although it's, it's not, completely there yet, it's at least um, showing quite promising uh, progress. But of course, as I said, it's not the only type of fish that works as a, as a model. And indeed, some actually, perhaps not surprising, but some of the, the, the most impressive fish robots are almost the ones that you can buy for, <laughs> for entertainment or for, for toy uh, I have another video, I'm sorry, there's quite a few videos, but it's just some of these aspects are much easier to explain in a, in a video. And it's quite impressive um, looking robots are used for ornamental purposes, a Korean one. And now you start to see that they actually, I mean, they're quite scary in a way with the <laughs> <laughs> light in there. So they use the sort of the, the red laser light to determine distances to the to the glass basically so they can avoid it. You can see sometimes it comes up. But you see that now this is actually movement that is quite naturally uh, resemble the biological movement you, you see in an actual fish. Um, I mean, of course, I guess that they're not particularly clever or anything like that. They just know how to avoid the sides of the, um, sides of the aquarium. But you see that they move in a way that is quite interesting. So, so we, can, we can develop more naturally looking uh, robots as well. And of course, there is, so I, I focused a little bit on the, on the sort of the technical applications and how you can build robots, but it's actually also quite interesting from a biological perspective, if you can create artificial animals, you can do quite a lot of uh, experiments in those that can help you actually understand, understanding the real animals better, because of course you'd be able to manipulate the locomotion or the behavior of a robot in a much easier way than you'd be able to um, to do that for an actual um, for an actual fish. Yeah. So you're describing this as though it's an academic endeavor, but um, the military is funding it. Who else is funding this? Who is interested? Are there corporate sponsors? Are there government sponsors? I says ma ma mainly those ones that was developed so far are funded by either the army or within sort of normal university grant. Uh, but there are companies, as I said, these sort of more for toys or for ornamental perspectives, that's industry, right? That's mainly interested in, in funding in those. And, and as you could see, although the robot probably wasn't as clever, they were actually not particularly behind the ones developed by the universities as such. So, um, so there's quite a lot, of, a lot of different funding ideas. As I said, the oil industry is interested, but of course, I think you have to prove, make more of a proof of concept before you get industry completely involved, because we are still quite far away from having you know underwater robot that can move around for days or, or weeks basically under under the sea by themselves without any any maintenance but it's a sort of a general idea we, we get back a little bit to the funding also when i talk about the robots in in the flying phase in a bit but i just wanted to, sh to show you that of course it's not all robots it's also other type of materials you can produce i'm sure you all know of the geckos impressive animals that can move up uh, vertical surfaces 
And the reason they can do that is that they have some very, very fine hairs. So if we look sort of at a, at a more and more uh, magnification scale here, you have the, the feet. The feet have some grooves on them. On the grooves, there are some small hairs. And then on the top of those hairs, there's a lot of tips, basically. So we get very, very small now. Um, I think that's one, that's one nanometer. It's almost difficult to see one micrometer. But it, they're very, very small now. Uh, I think this is the micro scale, right? Yeah, so that's the nanoscale at the very end. So that we are in a very, very small scale now. And what that actually means is that we are now in such a small scale, and you have so many of those, that small, weak uh, electrical forces between the molecules of the substrate and the hair are now starting to play a real role. And actually, that is, is what we call van der Waals forces. Um, yeah, right there. Um, you can look that up. It's an interesting aspect that we are so, now so small that we can actually use these forces, or the gecko can use these forces to, to get the adhesion to a surface, basically, just because it has so many uh, surface area now due to the, to the hair. So as you can imagine, I mean, this is a small little part of the feet, right? This is all tons and tons of sea tape. And then on each sea tape, you have thousands of further small hairs. So you can see that it very quickly adds up to a very large number. So if we try and do something similar in, in the, our technology, we can actually produce uh, something that is called gecko tape, basically. And that is almost commercially available now, I think. So, I mean, this is one of researchers demonstrating how strong it is. But one, another idea of it, of course, is because the gecko is not just interested, obviously, in clinging adhesion to a wall. It needs to be able to peel off and move on. So the interesting bit is that the structures on, of the feet, although the force is very strong in the sort of the, the, the angular, direct angle away from the wall, if you move the feet in a shear force or so, uh, this kind of way, it's much, much easier to detach basically. So that allows the gecko to easily detach and that also allows you to, in theory, develop something where you could easily attach and detach the tape with, which I think probably would have quite a, lot, a few commercial interesting ideas about. So this is something I think that is very promising and hopefully will be out there commercially available relatively soon. I mean, one of the problems, of course, is that in, in a development phase, it's almost always exceedingly expensive to, <laughs> to develop the material. So you always need to find a way to make it much cheaper to produce and much uh, more uh, cheap to buy as well. So going back a little bit to the idea of robots, um, we talked about underwater robots, but of course, flying robots are also interesting. And, and you all heard about nowadays drones is everywhere in the news, basically. But the idea is maybe to build even smaller drones, basically, so what we call micro-air vehicles, very, very small uh, vehicles. And, and again, the idea, original idea mainly came from, again, the army. They wanted to be able to spy, wanted to have some surveillance, very small um, robots. But you could easily see that they could also function in general search and rescue missions in, in, in confined spaces uh, and, and things like that. Um, so again, the idea is that rather than having rather than having sort of traditional aircraft structure, so the drones, you know, we can buy drones nowadays, you can, you can control, they have rotors and stuff like that, and that works fine. But the smaller you go down, the less, um, the less good traditional rotors or in, in engines work, uh, and the better, obviously, flapping flight works. And that's because uh, they utilize much better the different flow regimes at the very, very low speeds and, and low uh, sizes. So just have a, I mean, you can, you can use quite a lot of insects, but one of the ones that are interesting are, are flies, dragonflies, and, and bees as well. Uh, but here I have a very quick video just showing you the movements of a fly, and pay particularly, uh, pay particularly attention to the movement of the, um, the wings, because that's where you can see the, rid of this. So look how actually how quite fine control it has with the wings that are moving back and forth and in a moment some kind of there's some kind of looming thing is, is approaching so the fly is making an evasive maneuver. This is obviously filmed very high speed so much slower than in real life but notice how it can also independently control each wing thereby giving it a lot of steering control. <coughs> So you can imagine, sorry, not really interested in this, it's just a robot thing. Um, 
So you can imagine that being able to generate something that could fly like a fly, be able to react that fast, maneuverability, steering, that would be uh, something really interesting. And therefore, there has actually been a lot of research in this area for the past 20 years. It turns out to be, again, perhaps not quite as simple as well, I don't know if you would imagine it's simple, but it is certainly isn't simple to try and reproduce something that can do uh, these kind of things. However, Harvard University has built a sort of very tiny robo-fly, basically a robo-bee, uh, that does do some of the ideas. So, I mean, the idea is obviously that you have a completely self-contained robot that have all the steering system and everything on it. We're not there yet, uh, but they do have, they have created something that at least flies now, which is a massive improvement because actually getting them off ground turned very, proved to be very difficult for about 10 years um, just because they're simply so small. But you can see it is tiny. It's not completely autonomous because there's a control line and there's a line feeding uh, energy into the mechanisms. But you see, and of course it's still not autonomous in the way that it's not really maneuvering or, or doing anything by itself, but at least you see that it can uh, take off and it flies a bit uh, like um, like a fly, so eventually we will probably uh, get there where you have something that can actually um, work like that. I mean, I like I went to their to their website, uh, and it's quite interesting that they mentioned one of the potential <laughs> potential application again was that if we eradicate all the bees, then we could have robo f robo bees pollinating the <laughs> the plant. I think hopefully <laughs> hopefully that's not going to be. <laughs> going to be relevant we should probably put more effort into saving the bees rather than doing this but I mean nonetheless I mean they do acknowledge that they do say that this is a worst case scenario of course and it's only but it is it's kind of interesting to <laughs> to see that that kind of way I mean I should say in general biomimetics is interesting also for biologists for a number of reasons but one reason is that if you claim something I mean these are not biologists but I'm just saying for my own thing if you claim something has biomimetic potential and can be developed into technology it's sometimes quite a lot easier to actually get funding <laughs> rather than saying I'm interested in this because of the biology behind it. Uh, so people sometimes oversell a little bit their applications and things like that. But let me just talk a little bit about uh, spiders as well, just because, as I said, my main interest. Um, spiders, there's a quite a, a large number of them, not quite as many as insects though, but quite a lot of them spread all around the world. What's interesting about them is that all of them relies on silk throughout their lives. So that's where they differ from insects, which typically only rely on silk in few stages, particularly in the larval stages when they build a cocoon, for example. Um, but in contrast to that, spiders use silk all the time. Not all spiders actually use silk, as you might have thought, to catch prey. It's only about half of them. Uh, but still, it's quite a large percentage that have way, found a way of utilizing this silk. So the silk is being produced inside the spider, basically, and extruded through the spinnerets at the end of the abdomen. So, I mean, I don't know if you can see it properly, but it's quite fine structures, almost like a needle-like structures that extrudes uh, the silk. And what's interesting is that in the spider, the silk is stored as a liquid, basically. And then as it's forced through the, the from the glands, through the, the various ducts and out into the, to the, to the real world, it turns into a solid, basically. And I'll come back to that, why that is particularly interesting uh, in a second. But just also to mention another thing, maybe if you think about spider silk, you think that spider silk, actually there's quite a lot of different types of spider silk. So a, a spider can typically produce uh, five, six, or up to seven different types of silk. Each have their own mechanical properties. I'm going to again explain what these graphs means in a second, but just so that you can hopefully see that each of the silks here have different types of properties, and that's because they're being used for different kind of things. So uh, particularly the frame, the safety line, is this sort of the strongest one, of course, as a safety line. You know spiders runs around, they have a silk thread behind them. If they fall, they can crowd back on it. So that has to be quite strong, obviously. And they also use it for the sort of the frame and the anchor threads on the webs that they build. And then we have various other types of, of silk that's not quite as strong, uh, although the mine ant blade is almost the same, they use that for building a, sp a spiral and for ballooning. Uh, and then you have prey wrapping, you have for egg sacs, and you have for the capture spiral in the sort of the orb web spiders. So basically, what do we mean with uh, mechanical um, 
property. So as I said, one way that you, if you want to, to test something like this as a, as a set thread, one way you can do is you can just basically put it in a machine that pulls it apart. And then you measure how much force is required to make it longer and longer. And when does it actually break? So at what force does it snap? And as what length does it snap? So that's what we have here. The stress is the force required to pull, pull it. And the strain is the sort of the length you can pull it forward before it actually breaks. So this is, you can understand as a sort of a percentage. So 20% of its original length, for instance, would be here, right? So if you compare spider silk with other types of materials, so spider silk, this is different spiders. You see they vary a little bit in their silk, but only a little bit. Uh, and this particular silk we're looking at, and the one that we are mainly interested in, it was the... Um, was this one, the maybe amplet one that they use for the frame and safety line, because I as I said, that's one of the strongest silk. You see, that's a little bit in the spiders, but not much. Compared to Kefla, or indeed steel would also be, that would stop around here. You see, it's not actually as strong as steel and Kefla. Uh, so that's a common misconception. But what is interesting is that it's very strong, but it's also very elastic. So the toughness of the silk, which is, if you imagine the area under the curve, is a measure for toughness, which is the idea of how much energy can it absorb before it breaks, basically. Uh, you see suddenly it's much, much better than Kefla and steel, which is a steel would be more or less the same line just stopping around here somewhere. Um, and also it's much better than, um, than <coughs> the Mori, that's the silk moth, uh, one that's often the commercial silk uh, we use from, the, from that one, much stronger than that. You can produce some nylon strings and some rubber ones that would have very lo long elasticity, but then they would have very low force, so they would again would not be able to compete uh, in a combination of material that spider silk does. So of course you can then use that, if you can create artificial spider silk, you can create material that, can, uh, that you can use for impact resistance basically, so they will deform and absorb the energy. For instance, if you had that on a car, potentially you would be much, much better off in an accident and things like that. So there's quite an, a large interest for trying to come up with artificial <coughs> spiders. Did you have a question? Yeah, the end of the graph, where is that where it fails? Yeah, sorry, I should say that. Yeah, So this would be where it sort of breaks, uh, basically. So that this, this, if you imagine putting it apart, the thread snaps. Um, so as you can see, you can, you can perhaps not surprise the Kefla, and, and as I said, also steam or less the same. I mean, you cannot pull that very far. And it's not very elastic. I mean, that's <laughs> what we understand. So that's um, why it has rather poor ability to absorb uh, energy. OK, so as I said, we want to be able to produce artificial spiral silk. And we have actually made quite a lot of progress in producing uh, the solution. So the uh, copying the chemical uh, background or chemical constituents of the silk. Uh, so I'm not going to read this out here, but just saying that um, we can do it both in, in goats, we can get bacteria to produce it, and lately we also managed to get um, to get moth, uh, uh, silk, silkworm moth to produce, uh, silkworm moth larvae to produce the spider silk. However, the problem is, as I said, it's not enough to have it as a liquid. You need to turn it into a solid, and that's where we have severe problems. Um, so, so far, the best artificial spider silk is down here, the real spider silk up here. Again, you see not nearly as strong as the real spider silk. And the reason why it's difficult is that um, the combination of the complexity of what's going on inside the spider body with removing water, with moving through different ducts, and the forces that the spider produce when it pulls the silk out of the, out of the spinneret, all of this is determining the mechanical properties. So it's very, very difficult to be able to do that in this exact same way as the spider. We haven't been able to do that yet, and we're probably quite a bit far away from that. However, there's also, you can use um, already the artificial spiders that we have already. There's actually application for that, particularly in surgery. So for instance, if you have nerves, uh, you know, you get some kind of nerve damage, your nerve breaks, they, need, they can regrow, but you need to in order for them to regrow, you need to tie them together almost so that the nerves will naturally uh, bridge the gaps and rebuild. And there, it's actually ideal to use something like artificial spinal silk because it's still strong enough to hold these nerves. It doesn't need to be that as strong as real spinal silk for that. Uh, and then it has the advantages that it's a biological material. It doesn't trigger much of an immune response. 
and also it's biodegradable, so it disappears by itself. The body absorbs it by itself eventually. Okay, so the conclusion, quick conclusion, is basically that the biometrics, as I said, high growth phase, still not too many commercially uh, available products at the moment. Uh, that's because nature is complex. We still don't have the technology, although with, with the new technology we're developing, particularly perhaps 3D printing that you may have heard about, we're now able to produce quite complicated structures that could sort of start to mimic biological ones. Um, and I would also say at, at the last, it's good to have, I think the different approaches where you have biologists or people interested in nature just saying, wow, that's, that's amazing, and then you take it from there is, is a good one, but also you need more engineers perhaps using the design principles from biomedics from the start. But as a biologist, I would still argue that you should, ideally to do proper biomedics, you should have a collaboration between uh, biologists and engineers or other type of physical scientists. Okay, so are there any questions? So I'm sorry it took me quite a bit longer than I had expected, but uh, <laughs> fascinating example. So, yeah. How far have we got with um, mimicking photosynthesis to trap solar energy? Well, I mean, again, it turns out to be slightly difficult to, to do it in exactly the same way as the plant does. But the way that we, so I'm not an expert on the way, on the way we're doing it, but I think we're using some of the same chemical um, processes, but not to the same degree. So our, the efficiency of our solar panels are way below plants at the moment. But you may be able to get up there, but perhaps not necessarily by, by biomimetic approaches there. That may, I mean, I should say, of course, as a biologist, I like the biomimetic idea, but it's not always the best solution, right? I mean, there's a reason why biology doesn't work at high temperatures and uh, using using a very limited amount of number of materials, right? I mean, and there's no wheels in nature. I mean, you cannot do e everything <laughs> the way nature does it. We will have to use traditional engineering principles as well. So I think solar, I, I doubt we'll be able to really copy what's going on in, in the plants, but, but maybe, yeah. Um, I know this is uh, sort of beyond the scope of this, this lecture, but you seem to know quite a bit about spiders. I didn't I know do they, they had different types of silk for different uh, tasks. Do they ever get it wrong? Is there any research? You mean if they use the wrong I silk? Yeah. Well, ah, that's they make the wrong decision. That's interesting. I haven't actually come across anything like that. I guess they don't, but I mean, it's true. How do they make, because they have to make snap quick decisions exactly. when they're catching prey and things like that. So that's an interesting question. But I haven't come across any examples of it. But, yeah. If you get them high on caffeine, they make the webs wrong. They do, and I have actually done a bit of experiments myself on that, so they make very strange webs. But they're still, I don't actually know, but I don't think they get the silk wrong. I, I, it's what they do with it. They, it's exactly, it's what they do with it. It's a behavioral process of, as you can imagine, if they have some kind of neurotoxic drug, the whole brain, the coordination system is going haywire, so they're not as good as building the material. But it's actually interesting. I don't actually know if people have looked at whether the silk is also different. That should be something I want to go and look up, actually. But uh, <laughs> Yeah. You mentioned so far that few success stories, and one often used counterexample is actually flight. Because we don't fly not by imitating birds, we learn it by investigating the basics of turbulence and flow, and Ex then figure out how to build airplanes and so on. Exactly. So, yeah. And long term, how promising do you think this approach is? As, as opposed to kind of <laughs> fundamentals. As, as I said, it's not. For all, I mean, there's definitely not for all solutions, but magnetic is, is the correct one. But I think it, it's an additional tool in an engineering design toolbox, basically. So if you can take ideas from nature, you can use your traditional engineering background as well, but getting inspired from ideas from nature. I think that's the way to take it forward. And in terms of flight, I mean, it's not directly biomimetic, as you said, but is it biologically inspired? Would we have ever dreamt of inventing flight if we hadn't seen birds flying and all that kind of stuff? Would there have been the motivation or the attempt to try it? Maybe not. So, I mean, it's sort of, I mean, and actually also with flight nowadays, I think there are also biomimetic. I think with these wing tips, stunts they're doing is, is what birds are adding little tips, little feathers on their wings to sort of, I think it's to reduce the aerodynamic drag and the turbulence at the, the wing tip spaces. So you see the new modern airplanes, right, that go, the wings goes upwards, basically. I think that is, if not directly biomimetic, at least sort of inspired in some way. Um, saying about uh, silkworm silk and also like caterpillar silk. Is it the same, basically the same material as mm. 
More or less, not exactly. As I said, they, they, they've got a, a, a silkworm to create exactly the same constituents as there's in spider cells. So it's not exactly the same. The difference is not massive. It's a, it's a difference in the, in the, in the proteins, uh, some of the proteins and things like that. The, the, sort of the structure of it is, is more or less the same. So I think the main, potentially the main difference in the mechanical properties are to do with how it's being produced, as I said, um, going from a liquid to a solid, more or less. Okay, just before I finish, I just wanted, because I want to do a little bit commercial for, <laughs> for, the, for the actual program we have at the department as well. So very quickly, just saying that we run uh, some online courses, of course, uh, and we run one on animal behavior, which is perhaps particularly relevant for what we was talking about here. There we'll go through quite a lot of different types of animal uh, behaviors. That's also taught as a weekly class, uh, although not this year, but it will be the, the coming year. Then we have some mapping, uh, some GIS stuff where you can uh, develop ideas of how to make maps and use computer software to analyze spatial data. And finally, in developing, we are trying to develop something to um, a course on evolutionary biology to give an introduction to evolutionary biology and thinking. Um, I'm not sure why this one's not working anymore, but um, we also run a number of weekly classes, of course. There's actually start, some starting already next week. Uh, one about birds, again, quite relevant to some of the topics we talked about here. No, I didn't really use birds as an example, but bird is, an, is a fascinating model for many types of, of behaviors. Uh, and there's also a course on human anatomy, so getting more an idea of the actual uh, biomechanics behind some of these things. Uh, next, early next year, we run an animal diversity course, again, that will focus on the whole diversity of animals. There won't be much biomimetic in it, but there will be the idea of getting an idea of the whole sort of uh, that form and variation in, in animals. Then there's a cancer course as well in Reading, I should mention. Uh, and finally, we have uh, later on some ecology courses, some climate change courses, and some more gene therapy. And finally, we have, again, course that will be quite relevant for what we just talked about here, how animals work. As I said, that's the main idea. You need to know how animals work before you can actually try and copy uh, the ideas. We also run day schools, as you know, and actually we have a very relevant day school coming up here at the end of October. So that is trying to using biomimetic management. So rather than just taking direct um, sort of fo fo uh, morphology and uh, things from nature, as I've mainly been showing here, they're trying to argue that the, the management, the behavior of the animals in a group, um, you can learn something from that. And they particularly use ants, as you know, as a very hardworking individuals that can manage a very complex structure, such as the ant nest, without any clear, they don't have a clear boss, right? It's all sort of uh, simple behavior rule that leads to it. I have something about Christmas coming up, perhaps not so much in biological science, but it does have something about natural history, which is why I, I'm organizing it, but it's more sort of an integrative course. Uh, and we have some more uh, courses about medical stuff coming up uh, next year, and evolution again in the fossils. Um, and finally, uh, in the spring term, I mean, there will be more courses coming up, so do have a look at this, the website. There will be more courses coming up with the Natural History Museum as well. Uh, but otherwise, we have some sort of more, again, more interdisciplinary type courses where we look at botany, but also from a medical perspective, from a human perspective, be something about uh, plants, again, quite interdisciplinary ones with also not only look at the natural history, but also how, how trees feature in literature and in history. And then finally, there will be something about um, giving birth, basically, and how you can use ideas both from medicine and from anthropology. Um, and yeah, so that is more or less it. So if you do have any kind of ideas for courses you'd like to see, if you have any suggestions, do email me, do comments, and talk to me now. I just want one fun thing as well. How many of you have actually taken courses with the department before? Can I see a show of hand? And how many of you have taken courses in the sciences within the department? So a few of you. Okay, that's quite good because we are trying to sort of build the whole courses in sciences a bit more. This, as you probably have noticed, so fewer courses in sciences than there are in many of the other disciplines. So we are trying to, to, <laughs> to grow that. Uh, we are also trying to build a qualification type uh, course. Um, you may have heard about the undergraduate certificate of higher education, which runs at the moment of the department, but again, having mainly human humanities type courses, trying to build something in biological science. And if you have time, 
there is some, some uh, paperwork down there that, sh that shows, that sort of asks if you're potentially interested in a course like that. So please do give your, your name at the, sort of the end of that if you are. Any final questions? Excellent. I hope you got a bit of an idea. It's a quite quick overview, but hopefully it gives you an, an idea. So, yeah.